Hello and welcome to Apex Incident Tips episode number 159 brought to you most Fridays at 12.05 Eastern Time. And that's Eastern Time, whether it's Eastern Standard or Eastern Daylight, it's it's Eastern Time. And most of the time I'm here, but the last couple of weeks I've been uh, I've been just a little too crazy busy. Uh, how about you, Marwa? How have you been? I've been great. How are you, Anton? Great, great. Um, well, thanks again for joining me on a Friday at my lunchtime, your dinner time. Uh, and, uh, um, but uh, this week's uh, tip is really, really just like a few seconds of a tip, but, but we're gonna walk you through a little bit more and, um, and talk to you about the IG cookbook. Uh, and the IG cookbook is something everybody should be using. Uh, but we'll talk about that as we get going. Why don't you jump in, share your screen, and I'll kick off the timer because we just have five minutes. Yes, thank you, Anton. So as you said, uh, this is the Apex IG cookbook. You can find the download link on this blog post written by John Snyders. Yeah, and John is the primary developer of the interactive grid on the Apex team. This is his personal blog, but he publishes this IG cookbook. I actually recommend that, like, we'll, we'll give you the link to it, but this one's getting a little bit old. I'm hoping he'll publish a new one soon. So try to find the newest IG cookbook. But this is this is the current IG cookbook. So excellent. Yes. What do you do with it? Well, uh, we download the application and then install it on our own workspace to try it out. But before that, we need to install the sample interactive grid application from the gallery because this IG cookbook application is using some of that uh, application tables. So that's okay. what I did. I installed this application on my workspace. And as you can see, there are a lot of um, tips and tricks uh, on interactive grids. And yeah, and this is something I'll say is a lot of people think maybe they'll never use an interactive grid or if they use an interactive grid, they'll just use the base one and use just a normal interactive grid. But I really encourage you, even if you feel that way, to go through here, hit every one of these pages and see the amazing things you can do with an interactive grid because it, you may not even realize what, what you can implement within an interactive grid. Exactly. And on each of those pages, there is an, the, the notes section with a very useful description and sometimes useful links. So let me show you um, an example of those uh, tips. For example, the Spark chart sets. Now here we have an interactive grid with the column that displays a little chart, as you can see here. Oh, yeah, that's definitely not native. <laughs> so how do we do it? Uh, okay, so when you take a look at the notes, it tells you where to go and look for the code on the page designer. It tells you here to see the page attributes, execute when page loads, and then the inline CSS and the HTML expression for the columns for the column views by day. Now, if you go to the page designer, at the page level, we have um, the execute when page loads, and this is actually so that's one just line. one line of code. That's one line of JavaScript. That's pretty easy. Pretty easy, pretty simple. And then we have some CSS, almost one line also. This is the inline CSS. Okay, great. And here we have the column views by day and it has the type HTML expression. And this is the HTML expression. It's very simple. Yeah, and I see that it, the items has and views by day. So the, the actual data that's being used is in that, that so there's a little trick here to get the right data into here, right? So how does John do that? Yes, I wanted to take a look at that column. So I went to the application grid query. I copied this query and just ran it through SQL workshop. And this is the columns views by day. This is the value of that column, see? Uh, so it's just a series of a JSON array of numbers. Okay, great. And so this is a starting point. If you wanted to do something like this, you would start here, you would review it, you would make changes for your application. Um, that's great. So, but Marwa, I titled this, this episode, Recipes from the IG Cookbook, 
where no code skips right through low code to high code. This actually seems really low code. It looks like people don't have to do much at all to get some cool functionality. Yes, because there are other examples with a lot more code, even high code, like this example, update selection. And in this example, you can select like you see, see already the notes. There's a lot more notes than the, than the other one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you can select multiple records and then go to the selection action menu and you have the increased salary. Yeah, that's here. definitely not normally there. So good. Yeah. You got to figure out how to put that in there, how to create this, this little screen. And then what happens? When you click on OK button, the salary of, is updated of the record that are selected. Oh, but, but it actually is just updating the model, right? It's not saved yet? It's not saved yet. No, you have to click uh, on save. So all of this happens in JavaScript. So you have to write the JavaScript too, right? Exactly. You have to oh, write the okay. JavaScript. Let's take so, a quick look. So at the page level, uh, we, are, uh, we have some function declaration here, like the increased salary function, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then we have some code to, exec to be executed when page loads. And that's our five minute mark. Uh, but I think the point here is pretty well taken that uh, the way to use the Interactive Grid Cookbook is download it, install it, and then read the notes, and then learn the code, right? And so some of the code we'll learn in a five minute tip like this. Some of the code, when I look at this, how long did it take you to understand this code, Marwa, when you were going through this page? Well, I'm sure not more than five minutes, a little bit more than five minutes. <laughs> less than five hours? Oh, yeah, less than five hours. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but so that, that really is, I think, our tip today, is that, that this, the cookbook is super valuable, but it does it does introduce high code um, to our uh, to to our environment, but but I guess that's the great thing about Apex, right? Is you can do so much no code, it's really easy to get into low code, and really Apex gives you the opportunity to jump into high code pretty easily if, if you you know if that's where you need to go. Um, exactly, like you said, this is a starting point. What I usually do sometimes, I copy this application or, pay, or pages of it, and then I go make some changes, see what happens there, and keep the original application. Um, yeah, so this is a good, great starting point. So Fernando has a question about enable disable cells based on another cell's values, which seems not to work for new rows. Any idea? And my answer to that is yes, I have an idea. Um, and that's that I've had to do this kind of thing, not this exact one, but you, you actually have the ability to inject code into the new row creation uh, through the Apex APIs. So uh, if you go to apex.oracle.com slash JSAPI, that's the documented, um, the documented uh, uh, JavaScript APIs, and there are a lot of them for the interactive grid. And then within this IG cookbook, there are even more. And in fact, if you look through here, there'll be places where John has highlighted that he in this cookbook uses undocumented APIs and tells you use at your own risk. Um, in this particular case though, Fernanda, I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact details of how to, to do what you're looking for, but you can definitely inject and, and interact with the the model um, when you click that add button um, there and there's at least one place where in the cookbook where where john does that with the the add row button he does that but also um he also has the ability to duplicate rows down and other things that are described in here so unfortunately i don't have the i don't have the 30 second answer for you but um but but it's definitely it's something that you can do manually manually you have to write the code to to do it sorry my wife that was me uh jumping over our conversation um but i think that's it um uh any other any other last minute tidbits on on the interactive grid cookbook itself any fabulous uh examples that you want to show really quickly before we move on to our wisdom of the week 
Well, there are a lot of really a lot of fabulous examples. I mean, none of them is like simple for me. All of them are great. So I encourage everyone okay. to install this application and take a look at those examples. Yeah, walk through them. Okay, so this week I do have a wisdom of the week. And my wisdom of the week uh, is related to uh, um, chess. And the, my wisdom is uh, you have to be careful if you're going to play speed chess or fast chess, chess, the game chess in Arizona. Um, speed chess, fast chess is where you have to complete your moves in a certain amount of time. And at, at the end, if you run out of time, um, you lose. Um, or, you, you know, anyway, it's, it's timed. Um, and you have to be careful in Arizona. And folks yes. may be aware that I have um, I have a little subspecialty in uh, dates, times, time zones, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, at one point, I wrote a very long blog post that I encourage everybody to read just at least the takeaways. Uh, you don't need to read the whole thing, but if you want to spend a couple hours, you can go through the whole blog post uh, in great detail. You can see there's a bit of detail here. Keep going, keep going. You'll get there. Eventually, we'll get to the end. Um, and oh my gosh, this is a long blog post. But fortunately, the, the gist of it is right at the top here. Um, and what this all comes down to is it's kind of crazy. Um, dates, times, time zones, you'd think they're simple, but they're not. So here is why you have to be careful when you're playing speed chess. I'm going to give, I'm going to start the timer. I'm going to give uh, 30 seconds. People can read. Okay, that was 30 seconds. So Arizona does not, Arizona does not observe daylight saving time. By the way, daylight saving, not daylight savings, it seems not to me, but they don't observe daylight saving time. So all of the states around them fall back an hour and gain an hour, but not Arizona. So if you're playing speed chess right when that happens and you're right on the border, you get that extra hour. Yes. Um, yes, and in addition to my blog post, I'll just point out there's also timeanddate.com. If you really love this kind of thing, you can go to timeanddate.com and have all kinds of fun reading about all of the craziness that's associated with time zones, with daylight saving time. There are time zones that are half an hour off. There are time zones that are 15 minutes off. Back in um, the sort of pre-railroad days, individual towns and counties would have their own time zone. Um, so you could have time zones that were just, you know, 15, 10 minutes apart. They, they would just base it upon the clock in the, in the center of town. Um, so, oh, the URL for my blog post. Um, let's see. It is right here. It is insum.talan.com slash a wrinkle in Oracle date and timestamp. I'll put it in the chat um, right now. Um, there we go. I don't know how long it'll last, but we'll get it in the, the show notes as well. Um, all right. Well, people have wasted a perfectly good 13 minutes uh, listening to us today, Marwa. We appreciate everyone jumping in. Uh, do you want to tell them to do all the things? Yes. Don't forget to like the video, share and subscribe and send a letter to your mom about the show. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.